Could you please give him a very, very warm Thursday morning welcome, Professor Tony Vasala. Thank you, Chris, and good morning. Um, it's so, so nice to be here. Um, and the reason, actually, that I did accept Chris's invitation, because normally I would say, look, sorry, Chris, I've just got so many other things to do, I can't, you know, I can't do it. But the reason I did accept it was because Going back a few decades, I was actually in your situation and uh, I was lucky enough to spend two weeks at a, a science school in Sydney that was held at the, uh, what is now the Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, which was way out of Sydney in the bush at that stage. And the two weeks I spent there, I think, really shaped my career. Um, <clears throat> and so, really, you know, these sorts of opportunities uh, can, can be life-changing. So I thought I should come here and give you, you know, my, uh, my experience and life, uh, uh, life lessons, uh, because this is the sort of thing that can and will change your life. So you're in, a, I think, a privileged position to be able to join together with people from all around the world and come and listen to uh, people who've got a lifetime of experience. So as Chris said, I wanted to talk today about electricity infrastructure. Um, and uh, the title of you know, sort of keeping the lights on, um, it's got a little bit old these days, but when I was, when I was your age, again, um, we had some blackouts in the state of New South Wales uh, because at that stage there was only a couple of power stations operating um, and they, they couldn't meet the demand of the growing uh, interest in getting electrical appliances. So this was in the 1970s. Um, and lots of new houses were being built, people were installing all the, all the mod cons, um, and the demand for electricity exceeded the supply, and it caused blackouts. Um, and that sort of galvanised the governments of the day to start a major building program for building new power stations and transmission lines, etc. And in fact, they overbuilt, which was actually quite a good thing because it's lasted really till now. But in those days, if the power went out, uh, well, you, you, could, you could go and read a book, you know, you could go and do something outside in the garden. Um, it, it didn't end your, product, your productive life. But today, if the power goes out, we wouldn't be able to, you know, you wouldn't be here. You couldn't have a health system that works. You couldn't have refrigeration that kept medicines and foods from, from spoiling. You wouldn't have your Wi-Fi for very long because your batteries would go flat. Um, and you wouldn't be able to recharge them. <clears throat> so today, delivering electricity stably and reliably, we take for granted until something goes wrong. And we're so, so dependent on electricity these days that I think we tend to forget um, what life without it could be. Um, so what I wanted to talk about in this first uh, lecture this morning, and I'm coming back this afternoon to talk about what's, what's over the horizon, <clears throat> But today I wanted to talk about design and operation of a national power grid and looking at things like the generation of electricity from burning fuels or collecting solar radiation or wind, etc., how that's then moved down to the power point, as Chris mentioned before. What's involved, what's the complexities, how, you know, what goes right, what goes wrong, etc. <clears throat> and then looking also at the related aspects of energy consumption and how the market um, allows that system to operate and how we interact with that market. And that's actually, it might, sound, uh, it might sound boring, but in fact it's the market operation that does uh, shape how the electricity system will be built and evolved and what we pay for it, etc., etc. So there's a, there's a good need to understand in um, economic and financial terms what the costs of these things uh, are. Okay, so feel free to ask questions or make comments as we go along. Uh, if something's not clear, let me know. So I just very briefly wanted to cover some, um, some fundamentals of energy and power, just in case people haven't, uh, you know, haven't been using these terms uh, in their studies so far. Um, energy and power, closely related. Um, and energy is really a measure of the capacity of a system or a body, you know, body in inverted commas, not a, necessarily a, an, a human body, but 
a body which could be as much as, uh, you know, it could be the size of a planet or it could be, you know, some, some microscopic organism, to do work. The work is what we're after. That's the output. And energy is really just the power multiplied by time. Okay, so in uh, physics you would probably have learnt that P equals VI, power equals volts times current, um, and if you multiply that by time then that's the energy that basically gets used. Um, there is a distinction between power and energy, and I'm going to be flipping between the two, so you need to appreciate the difference. Okay? Uh, I'll skip over the analogy with driving because we'll, we might come back to that later. But here is an example of three uh, systems, okay, all using or converting the same amount of energy but at different times to show you the effect of time and what we mean by power. So, for example, the half dozen sticks of dynamite there have a chemical energy, a chemical potential of 258 megajoules. Okay? Um, and that energy is converted to, uh, through a chemical reaction to heat and sound and light in a few microseconds. So the, the power associated with that chemical conversion is 5 terawatts. 5 times 10 to the 12 watts. That same amount of energy, 258 megajoules, if it's converted to another form in 5 seconds, is the equivalent of delivering power at 50, 51 megawatts. Okay? So that is like that uh, uh, dragster there, converting chemical energy into mechanical motion, heat, light and sound as well, over a period of 5 seconds. So that dragster is powered at 51 megawatts. Um, and the last one is the same amount of energy, 258 megajoules, but over about an hour and a half. Okay, so this small city car is consuming the same amount of energy, but over a longer time period, so the power involved is much lower, it's 51 kilowatts. Okay, so same energy, different time rates, result in different powers. Uh, I think you probably all know already that the unit of energy is the joule, okay, so I won't, no, no need to labour that. But there are other units that we're going to use now when we talk about the electricity system, power generation, energy conversion, and some of these units you may not be that familiar with. Okay? So um, often in el electrical systems we do talk about watt-hours instead of joules, for example. Okay? Now a watt-hour is one watt for one hour, 3,600 seconds, and a joule is, uh, sorry, a watt is one joule per second. Okay. So a watt hour, you can see, is, it's not a huge amount of, of energy, 3,600 joules. And I think from a vague recollection somewhere, uh, a joule is approximately equal to the amount of energy associated with one heartbeat. Okay. Um, or the energy that an apple might have if it fell a metre or so. So you can see a joule is a very small amount of energy. And when we talk about large power systems, uh, we're going to be talking of you know, trillions of watts. So the uh, units that we use um, are going to be a little bit unfamiliar occasionally. So we talk about kilowatt hours, megawatt hours and terawatt hours being a thousand watt hours, a million watt hours or a million million watt hours. And a kilowatt hour, which is a very typical unit of electricity consumption that we'll hear about, is 3.6 megajoules. Okay. Uh, occasionally you'll also see these weird units, which is not actually an M tow, but it's a million ton of oil equivalent. And this is what um, international energy comparisons generally use, because oil, um, oil is traded internationally. Um, it's a large amount of energy and so um, some analysts talk about millions of tonnes of oil equivalent. There's also British thermal units uh, which are used in the USA but not used in Australia for example and that's just over a, a kilojoule of energy. And the Americans often talk of quads. These are quadrillion BTUs. Now you can see they're coming up now into the 10 to the 18th joules lots of energy. Okay. Um, and then there's the, the calorie, you know, which you'll um, see on the side of 
food packets, for example, um, and that's 4.184 uh, joules. To take a closer look at something like this, um, and we will be talking about specific energy and energy density, um, and these are terms used to describe uh, how much energy might be in a certain mass of fuel, for example, or a certain volume of fuel as well. So energy density and specific energy. <coughs> so Tim Tams, for those um, who, are, who are not from Australia, are a, a quite a, a popular chocolate biscuit okay, in Australia. Very high in energy, lots of fat and sugar. <laughs> so we can go through and have a, have a, a calculation of uh, what the specific energy and the energy content of these are. If you look at the side of the, the packet, you'll see it says energy per 100 grams, 2,170 kilojoules. So that's you know, 2.1 megajoules of energy in 100 grams of these biscuits. So the specific energy of a chocolate biscuit is 397 kilo, kilojoules, which is the uh, one serving, okay, 397 kilojoules, or 21.7 kilojoules per gram, we convert the kilojoules to, to watt hours and we get six kilowatt hours per kilogram okay, of biscuits. You can compare that to petrol. Uh, petrol has 47 megajoules per kilogram. Chocolate biscuits, 21 megajoules per kilogram. So your chocolate biscuits have roughly half the energy, the chemical energy content of petrol. Hence, if you eat too many chocolate biscuits, you tend to um, uh, store a lot of energy and you eventually you'll, uh, you'll start to put on weight. Okay. Um, and that's the, that's the chemical energy in the biscuit. So if you were able to fully burn or combust that biscuit, that's the amount of chemical energy that you could get back and do something with. And that might be, for example, um, heating up some water or doing some other work from the energy of those biscuits. So doing a little bit of um, analysis with some very simple thermodynamics is also uh, a useful way to look at these things. So I'm not sure if you've all done any, had any background in thermodynamics, but you've probably heard about you know, the laws of thermodynamics. And the first law, in inverted commas, because not actually the first law, but it's called the first law, is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, uh, but it's transformed. Okay, so you burn the biscuit, you burn the fuel, or you burn the coal. The energy that was bound, uh, in there is chemical energy, chemical bonds between the atoms, the molecules. That energy is released as, as heat um, and other byproducts, and it's transformed. So it's not lost. Okay? It's, you can convert energy, but you can't obviously create it from nothing, and you can't destroy it. So chemical energy in fuel can be converted to, to thermal energy, to heat, and then that heat can be converted to mechanical energy, as in a turbine, and then converted to electrical energy. So when you're burning a fuel, like coal or gas, you're creating heat. The heat can then be harnessed to do work, mechanical energy rotating a machine of some description. That machine can then be used to convert that motion into electricity through a generator. And that's the basics of a, a coal-fired power station. Not necessarily run on chocolate biscuits, but on coal or gas or something else. So that electrical energy then can be converted to thermal energy as well. So, for example, you can plug in an electric jug and use the electricity that's been created at a power station and heat up the water. Okay. So that's another conversion. Um, but the... The problem, I guess, in real systems is that every time you're doing a conversion, you're losing some energy because it's not possible to convert without losses in the real world. Okay. The losses can be small, they can be large, but you always have a loss. So the challenge is to avoid having so many conversions all the time okay, because every conversion is a loss. And we'll see later uh, what those losses mean in reality when we're looking at large coal-fired power stations that may be 200 kilometres away, how the energy that actually gets to our power point for us to use is only a small fraction of actually what was in the coal to start with. 
And I put down there, can we actually not conserve energy? Uh, meaning that um, we, we have no option. Energy is always conserved. So when people talk about the conservation of energy, they're not actually meaning it in a thermodynamic sense. They're probably meaning that we, don't, we shouldn't be wasting fuel, okay, which was then converted to energy and used for something else. But energy is always conserved. It just may be in a form that is not useful for us to use, and that would typically be something as waste heat. Okay? Heat is useful uh, if you have a, uh, a need for something like to heat water or do something else, but typically lost energy in a conversion process ends up as heat, and that heat can't be captured and used. We'll see a little bit later how much of the, the lost energy goes to heat in a power station um, and how actually inefficient the whole system is. So some of these common energy conversion processes are things like we just discussed, uh, fuel to heat, okay? um, fuel to electricity, fuel to motion, a solar energy to electricity. So this is uh, you know, solar radiation that can be captured and converted to electricity as in a photovoltaic cell. Uh, wind, which is the, the motion of air, can be captured and converted to electricity. We can have solar to chemical energy, which is like the photosynthetic pathway. Um, and there's probably plenty of others that you can think of as well. Okay, so our whole civilization is based around the conversion of energy from one form to another. And if we're not doing that very efficiently, we're basically just creating masses of waste heat, which is a, is a loss of the, um, uh, the order that's in the, the, the chemical fuels, for example, that we're using. Um, and I, I won't, well, I will, I will mention entropy a little bit later, but that's where the concept of, of order and disorder uh, comes into the uh, electricity production scheme. Um, quickly, just some of the units that uh, we're going to be coming across. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, mega, million, giga, 10 to the 9, so 1,000 million. Depending on where you come from, sometimes uh, you'll hear things like a billion being referred to as a 1,000 million or a million million. Um, here we're talking about um, a billion being giga, so 10 to the 9. Terra, 10 to the 12. Peta, 10 to the 15. Uh, Exa, 10 to the 18. Um, and in some cases, even that's not enough, and we end up having to go to things like uh, Zeta and Yotta, which are even, even larger. Anyone here ever come across Zeta and Yotta yet? Yep, okay, good. What, what's, what's the power for Yotta? Sorry? 24? Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, power is the, the rate of energy use or exchange of energy between two systems. Um, and it, it can be heat or work or both. Okay? So you can transfer energy via heat and there is a power that is associated with that as well because it's energy over some time period. Um, so if you look at some of the scales there, it turns out that you know, a hard working student um, is consuming about 100 watts of chemical energy uh, continuously. So that is, um, and, and uh, a lot of that is actually associated in your brain because the brain actually does require a lot of energy. It needs a lot of glucose, a lot of fuel, um, and so much of that 100 watts is associated with you know, your, your cerebral processes. So just sitting, thinking, doing that sort of thing is about 100 watts of power that is being used through the conversion of um, carbohydrates, sugars, um, to electrical and other forms of energy in your brain. And you can compare that to a, one of the older incandescent light bulbs that used to be rated at 100 watts. You know, that's where the bright shining light bulb has had an idea is the comparison is roughly the same, okay, about 100 watts. A toaster needs about a, a thousand watts, so it needs about a kilowatt, okay? So really, you know, 10 hard-working students, the power that they are using uh, would be the equivalent of making a slice of toast, okay, over a minute or two. A small four-cylinder car at full power is about 100 kilowatts of power. Um, a jumbo jet that is cruising, about 250,000 
kilowatts. Um, and a coal-fired power station, which has a number of boilers and generators, one of those typically is about 660 megawatts. So you can see that the, uh, the scales start to uh, grow very, very quickly. Uh, and interestingly, the takeoff of the space shuttle, you can calculate uh, the, the power involved with that, and it's about 14,000 megawatts. So it's equivalent almost to the entire electrical power that a state like New South Wales uses, except it's over about, I don't know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that. Okay? So it takes a huge amount of energy over a short period to put the space shuttle into orbit. It's about the same as the electricity consumption in a state like New South Wales for that period. Okay. Very, very huge. Um, energy content now, so not quite related to the power, but the energy that's in masses and volumes of materials. So a small AAA battery, you know, the sort that goes into um, a, a wireless mouse, for example, has about two watt hours of stored energy, about 7,200 joules. If you want to boil a litre of water from 20 degrees, that's about 335 kilojoules or 93 watt hours. And as you go through, you can see a litre of fuel, 34-odd megajoules, a tonne of coal, 23 gigajoules. Um, Australia's electricity consumption, about eight or ten years ago, 860 petajoules. But in terms of electricity, we talk about watt-hours, so about 240 terawatt-hours over the year. Um, looking down to the second from the last line, the world's primary energy demand in 2008 was... 473 exajoules, so we're now up into the 10 to the 18 joules. But when you compare that with the global solar energy that is absorbed by the, the Earth, you can see that the amount of energy that we need to run society, civilization, is a tiny, tiny fraction of what the Earth absorbs from the sun. Now, that doesn't mean that's easy to get or convenient to use, but it does put into, uh, into scale our energy consumption needs as compared to what's available from other sources. Um, and we, we need to start understanding, I guess, the, the impacts of these conversion processes um, and why we find ourselves in a situation now where our existing use of fuels um, is causing some problems. Okay? So impacts of energy conversion and use, there are environmental impacts and we know, you know that emissions from fuel combustion, in particular greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide being the main one, is an issue, a big issue. We have land degradation from mining and using those fuels, particularly um, coal, oil and gas. Um, and there are other environmental impacts associated with burning fuel to make um, or to convert it into a form that we, we find convenient being electricity. But there's also other issues, for example, geopolitical. Okay. There is serious conflict in certain parts of the world based on the, um, the ownership or the custodianship of fuels, particularly, for example, in the Middle East, okay, where a large quantity of you know, the, the, uh, the Earth's oil uh, reserves are, and that's caused you know, wars in the past and may do so in the future. So geopolitical concerns are very, uh, very important. And there's economic concerns as well. Um, and energy poverty um, is a very serious one. In Australia, for a long time, the cost of our um, energy supply was so, was so low that it hardly, it hardly affected anyone. But interestingly, over the last decade, our fuel prices and our electricity prices in particular have really jumped from being some of the lowest in the world to now being some of the highest in the world. Um, and there's some interesting reasons and discussions as to why that has happened and what that means for Australia. And right at the moment, the, the government now, well, the federal government and the state governments and industry, are having a, um, a, an intense and emotional discussion about what this means for Australia. Because in the past, Australia had very, very cheap energy, very cheap electricity, um, very, very cheap coal, 
Um, and it allowed us to, uh, to undertake industries that were very energy intensive and to produce products that were, were competitive and cheap. And the, the classic example is uh, aluminium, aluminium production. Aluminium has been considered or called you know, solidified electricity because it takes so much electricity to make aluminium. And if you've got an energy system that is very cheap, as we did have in Australia, then it makes sense to use that energy in a process such as making aluminium, aluminium smelting. Now, our energy prices have gone up a lot, as I was saying, in the last five to ten years. And so the industry is saying, well, we, we can't afford to make aluminium and sell it internationally anymore because our energy costs are so high. So there are all these issues that come to play, and they all bear onto the, the formulation and the planning of electricity systems. So it's not just the availability of fuel, it's not just the issues associated with emissions and environmental degradation, but it's also very, very strong economic issues as well. And this is where a lot of the heated discussions come about, because one part of the industry or society will say, um, if we can't reduce our energy costs, then our industry is going to go offshore. We won't have jobs for people. We won't have income from those industries. And so our standard of living will drop. Other parts of the community are saying, but the cost to the environment and the issues associated with greenhouse gas emissions are such that we have to decarbonise our fuel. So maybe Australia shouldn't be a place where you can uh, produce very low energy, but at a high environmental cost. And so these discussions are uh, ongoing, uh, heated, they've become political, um, and in fact they haven't served us very well over the last few years at all. Um, just in terms of that CO2 emissions, uh, just remember, you know, all carbon-based fuels produce CO2 when, when converted, when they're burned, okay? Um, coal does, oil, natural gas, even biofuels produce CO2 when it's burned. The carbon ends up as carbon dioxide. Biofuels, at least, are, um, can be rationalised on the basis that the CO2 that's produced from burning a biofuel has come from a renewable source. So if that process of producing the biofuel, converting it to power, for example, or motion in a vehicle, can be part of a circular um, system, whereby the CO2 is then reabsorbed by the plants that gave rise to the biofuels in the first place. But biofuels on their own can be effective or can not be very effective in terms of their system-wide emissions. Um, and I won't, I won't be talking about biofuels in particular here at all, but there have been a few studies that have shown that um, some processes for producing biofuels are almost um, as emission intensive as burning oil in the first place. Uh, and that arises because of the systems that are used to produce that biofuel. If you're growing crops that require um, fertilizers, transport, machinery, um, and are inefficient, then those losses accumulate and you end up not being able to offset the CO2 emissions at all. So biofuels um, need a much, much closer analysis you know, it's not the case that biofuels on their own are fantastic and everything else is bad. So let's have a, um, a bit of a look at the chemical composition of some of these fuels that we, that we are converting or burning before we go and have a look at the, the bigger grid um, scale use of them. Um, coal, which is um, in Australia, it's a very, um, we're very well in, endowed with coal. We've got large deposits of black coal and brown coal. Uh, coal is uh, um, categorised according to its rank, R-A-N-K. Uh, low rank coal is like brown coal. It just hasn't been cooked under the ground for as long as black coal, for example. Okay? So brown coal has much more um, water associated with it than black coal. And typically, uh, a bituminous coal, you can see there's an approximate formula there, um, and coal doesn't have a single chemical composition because it's the result of um, fossilised um, and heat-treated plant material. It depends on the extent of that treatment, what plants were there in the first place, how long it's been in the ground, what temperatures it's reached, etc. 
But coal is roughly, if you had 100 atoms that you could pick out of a, a coal um, substance, about 58 of those would be carbon, 39 on average would be hydrogen, uh, two and a half would be oxygen, uh, almost one nitrogen per 100 atoms of coal, and a little bit of sulphur, depending on where it comes from. Uh, Australian coals are quite low in sulphur, whereas coals in the northern hemisphere are usually much higher in sulphur. So when you burn northern hemisphere coals, you create sulphur oxides, and that can end up as rain, so generally that sulphur needs to be captured when it's burnt. Um, in Australia, our sulphur is quite low in the coal, so we don't bother about trying to capture the sulphur oxides when it's burnt. But the hydrogen to carbon ratio of a, a black coal is about um, 0.7. So in other words, there is seven uh, hydrogen atoms for every 10 carbon atoms. So not quite one to one. Um, oil is a little bit reversed. It has slightly more hydrogen in it. Uh, it it's liquid, okay? so it has less of the other associated materials. It's largely hydrogen and carbon. And natural gas, if we assume is methane CH4, then it has you know, four hydrogen atoms per carbon. So when we burn these fuels, we create different amounts of carbon dioxide. Um, so now going back and having a look at how we would burn those fuels, we need just to understand a little bit about a thermal, uh, the efficiency of thermal processes for power production. And people talk about energy efficiency, and I'll be talking about energy efficiency as well. What do we mean by energy efficiency? Because we already know that energy can't be created or, de or destroyed. So what does energy efficiency mean? So in the power system, we define it as the fraction of energy that is converted to work. And it's the work that we want. Okay? So if you're burning a fuel, you're creating heat, the output of that process is going to be something like a mechanical motion, whether it's a car or a generator. And it's the work that comes out of it that we're interested in. Now, for a heat engine, there is a, a thermodynamic uh, constraint. And the constraint is that the efficiency of extracting the work from that, whatever that process is, that goes from a hot um, environment to a cold environment, the efficiency of being able to extract the work is proportional to the temperature difference between the hot part and the cool part. And uh, Carnot was a, um, um, I guess, an engineer um, who calculated early on that there is a maximum efficiency that if everything works in your favour, you would be able to expect from a system of two different temperatures. Uh, and the Carnot efficiency is basically one minus the temperature difference between the, the cold part, and I'll explain this in a minute, and the hot part. And so if, you, if you're looking at a, um, a gas turbine or a car engine or something like that, the hot part of the system is the combustion, where the flame is. The cold part of the system is the exhaust, the ambient temperature into which that heat will flow. So the heat is flowing from the combustion process through the engine out to the exhaust and into the environment. And it's that temperature difference that sets the maximum efficiency that you can expect. And the smaller that temperature difference, the harder it is to extract useful work. And what this means for a, a real system, like a power system, is that you have to try and get the hottest temperatures that you can. And so, for example, in a coal-fired power station, which is based on burning coal in a boiler to raise steam, the maximum temperature the higher that you can go in that steam temperature, the more efficient you can extract work from the fuel that you're using. And in coal systems, that temperature is usually limited by the materials that make up the tubes inside the furnace. These are high temperature alloys that can cope with very high pressure water vapour in them. And typically that maximum temperature is about 630 degrees or so. Okay, so the Carnot efficiency for a process that has a 600 
and 30 degree maximum temperature, exhausting into an environment that might have you know, a 20 degree ambient temperature, that maximum efficiency is fixed by that temperature difference. And the example I've got there here is if, and it, this has to be done in degrees Kelvin, okay, it's rather than centigrade or Fahrenheit. So Kelvin is 273 added on to the centigrade temperature. So if the cold environment is 300 Kelvin and the hot environment is 600 Kelvin, then the maximum amount of work that you could ever extract from that temperature difference is 50%. And that's the, that's the best. You can't do any better by you know, re-engineering it or doing anything else. It is a thermodynamic limit of thermal engines. So when engineers try and make thermal power stations more efficient, they have to try and develop higher and higher temperature alloys that can cope with very high pressure in the presence of water that materials will be stable over many, many years. Some of these alloys are, well, extremely expensive, very difficult to work with, almost impossible to bend or weld or do anything like that. They're almost in between a steel and a ceramic. Right? So there is an upper limit, really, to what you can expect from a, a thermal power station, a coal-fired power station. And that upper limit is about you know, 42, 45 percent meaning that more than half the energy content of the fuel is lost. It can't be captured and used as heat. Okay. Check the time wise. Okay. So this is what a coal-fired power station um, schematic would look like. <clears throat> there are uh, a couple of systems that we can see. Basically there is a, um, a boiler where the coal um, is brought in and fired in to the, um, to the boiler. There are steam pipes in there that uh, allow the heat to be transferred to the water. The, the water is um, produced to steam and goes into some turbines, the blades spin, and the um, alternator there converts that rotational mechanical energy to electrical energy through the use of magnetic fields, coils. But the interesting bit here is that if we do the calculations on the recovery of useful energy from that system, we can see that for this particular power station, which we've modelled uh, from up in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales, <coughs> there's 7,300 megawatts of fuel power. In other words, the amount of coal that's going into this power station has a, a fuel combustion energy content of 7,300 megawatts and this is like a continuous process, okay? That's the equivalent of something like, I don't know, um, 250 tonnes of coal a minute, something like that, going to the power station. The output from the power station is only 2,600 megawatts of electricity. So the efficiency of this power station is 36%. So you can see, really, we're producing more waste heat than we are electricity. But in, up till now, it didn't matter. We had lots of coal, we needed the electricity, we weren't concerned about other environmental aspects. So 36% recovery of your coal fuel energy to electricity was considered acceptable. This is the average globally for coal-fired power stations. On average, two-thirds of the fuel energy is lost, lost as heat that can't be recovered. The very newest power stations now with these very high temperature alloys uh, can get up to about 40, 41, 42 percent recovery. So you can see burning coal or thermal power generation in general is not that efficient at converting fuel to electricity. And when, you know, if you don't have a you don't have access to these sorts of cheap fuel resources then you start to be very very careful as to how you convert your, your fuel to electricity. Um, I won't go into the chemistry too much of it, but basically I think you've probably done a little bit of this in the past where you know, a mole of carbon would react with a mole of oxygen produce CO2. Um, but to get to, uh, I guess, the output is that I wanted to have a look at um, how much 
carbon dioxide is produced per unit of fuel. Um, and in this case, um, I've just got up here a um, petrol tank for a car to have a look and see how, that, um, how those numbers come out and how it's relatively easy to calculate what those emissions might be. So we're not looking here necessarily at power generation, but we're looking at conversion of fuel to transport. So we know that the fuel content is about 34 megajoules of chemical energy per litre. This particular uh, vehicle has got a fuel efficiency of 10 litres per 100 kilometres, which is not very good, but it's probably close to an average for a, uh, a fleet you know, in Australia. And we know the carbon content of that fuel from the Australian government um, statistics is about 630 kilograms of carbon per 1,000 litres. Um, so 63 grams of carbon is consumed per kilometre, and we know that 63 grams of carbon will end up as 230-odd grams of CO2. Okay. So this particular vehicle, burning that fuel, produces about 230 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre. Yeah. And we might come back to this if we have time and compare that with an electric vehicle, for example, and where the electricity comes from. So it's interesting, I guess, for us in a country like Australia to understand how much fuel is burnt to create the electricity that we take for granted, that we use. Um, now, the average Sydney home, okay, the average of all, you know, the so many million homes in Sydney, the electricity consumption per year is about 7 megawatt hours, 7,000 kilowatt hours. We know that the typical coal energy content the chemical energy in the coal is about 27 gigajoules per tonne or 27 megajoules per kilogram. And as we saw before, the efficiency of converting that to electricity is about 36%. We lose a little bit in sending the electricity from the power station to the home because it has to go through wires and transformers and switches and they're not perfect. There's some resistance, there is some heat generated, there are losses. So we have another 6 to 10% loss in the amount of useful work that we get from the power station. Um, and so when we do the calculation, we can see that on average, um, every day, a Sydney home on the electricity that it uses needs to burn about 7 or 8 kilograms of coal. Okay? So when you multiply that by a million homes, you can see we're talking you know, 10 million kilograms of coal being burnt every day. Um, now, when, um, if you're only doing this in a small part of the community, it's not, a, it's not an issue. But when the planet is burning millions of tonnes of coal per minute, then we start to influence the, the composition of the atmosphere, and that's the, the greenhouse issue that we, we, we know so well. Okay. Um, so now, moving on to how this fits into a power system, we mentioned coal-fired power stations, but there are other fuels, and gas is a well-used well fuel. Gas is burnt in turbines, um, and there are, there are two main types of gas turbines. Uh, the open cycle, which is also called the Brayton cycle, that's really just a simple, um, a simple single system where gas is compressed, fired in a combustion chamber that drives a turbine, and that turbine then can be connected to a, a generator, for example. Okay. This is called a, a, an open cycle turbine because the gases uh, flow in, are combusted and flow out. Okay. The, the other type of gas turbine is called combined cycle. And the idea of the combined cycle turbine is to try and capture some of the energy that's going out the exhaust pipe. Um, because the flue gases from an open cycle turbine still contain a lot of energy. It's not all been able to be recovered from the turbine. So there's a high temperature, high mass flow, high energy content going out the exhaust. So the combined cycle turbine puts some steam pipes in the exhaust to try and capture another round of, of uh, energy from the exhaust. So a combined cycle plant has two turbines. One is the primary one, like the top system, and then the secondary one is capturing extra heat from the exhaust running a, a steam turbine. So the bottom turbine runs on the combustion gases, 
the second turbine <laughs> runs on steam, like in an ordinary coal-fired power station. So a combined cycle plant can get up to about 55% efficiency. So just past halfway. So a little bit more than half of the fuel energy in the gas can be captured and converted to electricity. So that's a lot better than a, a coal-fired power station. But the challenge with gas is it's expensive. Okay? It's much cheaper to burn coal than it is to burn gas. So gas-fired plants generally don't run continuously. They don't provide a big fraction of Australia's electricity supply, even though they're more efficient, because gas is expensive. And we'll come to uh, shortly how, how electricity is priced. But you can see here there's, you can have small gas turbines. Uh, these are small units that uh, produce an output of about 30 kilowatts. You know, that's sort of, there's the, the human next to them, so you can see their size. Or you can have power station sized gas turbines. These are 160 megawatts apiece. Basically, the process is the same. Gas is compressed, it's burnt. The expanding gas impinges on a turbine blade, spins an alternator to generate electricity. There are other types of power generation, of course, and we don't, um, we don't exclusively just burn coal or gas in Australia. But I guess an interesting question that you might want to ponder is, are there thermodynamic limits for non-thermal power generation? Okay. In the past, what we just discussed, we were burning fuels and using a heat engine and extracting work from that flow of heat. If you don't have a thermal system, are you still constrained by the Carnot efficiency? Uh, and I guess you know, the answer is no. Okay? The Carnot efficiency relates exclusively to thermal systems. So systems like wind power and solar power are not strictly limited by the Carnot efficiency. And in examples of, at the bottom of the hydrogen fuel cell, you can uh, approach 65, 70% efficiency of converting your fuel into electricity with an electrochemical system because the, it's not constrained by extracting work from a temperature difference. So thermal systems are okay, but they are at the low, the low base of the fuel efficiency pyramid. Just to have a quick look at um, wind, wind power, okay, which is now becoming um, an integral part of many power systems around the world. Um, and I pose the question here, how much energy can you get from wind? Okay. So the, the wind energy um, is captured by the blades of a turbine. So it's interesting to know what is the maximum amount of energy that you can get out of moving air? Because if you think about it, if you extract all the kinetic energy from a column of moving air, what will happen? It'll stop, that's right. So you can't actually take all the energy out because your turbine won't operate. So it turns out that there is a maximum to operate at, uh, and we'll see in a minute what that is. But it's quite easy to calculate how much the maximum amount of energy you can get because you basically work it on the kinetic energy of the moving air, and the kinetic energy is basically a half mv squared. Um, when you substitute the mass um, into that equation, the mass is the density of air multiplied by the cross-section and the depth that you're trying to uh, extract from. And it turns out that the power is proportional to the cube of the airspeed. Okay? So double the airspeed, much more than double the power that comes out. Okay? It goes up by the Q power of the airspeed. And as I said, all this power can't be extracted. Um, there is a, a theoretical maximum, which is when the departing wind speed is about one third of the wind speed that's going in. And it turns out that it's about 59%. Okay? So when people talk about the efficiency or the, the low efficiency of things like wind power, it's not actually an efficiency that they should be talking about at all. That type of fuel efficiency really only applies to thermal power generation. Renewable sources such as wind and solar are not limited by that efficiency. 
So anyway, in, in our example of a, um, a rotor diameter of one meter and a wind speed of 10 meters per second, we can get approximately 300 watts out of that sized rotor. Okay? So remember, going back, 300 watts, um, not a huge amount of power. It won't run a toaster, uh, but uh, you can run a couple of light bulbs on it. Okay? So wind power scale, um, to get useful energy for a society, these turbines have to be very, very big. And that's why we start to see these turbines with blade, you know, blade diameters of uh, over 100 metres. Um, the other interesting thing, I guess, is that wind speeds don't provide uh, an accurate... Um, well, you, you, that's not true. The energy goes up with the cube of the speed, the wind speed. And so most of the energy is associated with the higher, the higher wind speed distributions. Um, so the average wind speed is not what you're after. And in fact, they use uh, something called the Weibull distribution to show where the optimum output from a wind turbine would be. Just sticking on the, the wind uh, issue for a moment because it comes into play with the power system that we're going to talk about in a minute. This is the output from one of the wind farms in a state of Australia, in South Australia, I think, um, Canunda Wind Farm, over a month. And the vertical axis is the output of the farm in megawatts. The horizontal axis is the, the, the time. Um, and you can see that you know, there are times when the output is very high and there are times when the output is very low. Um, so these have a, a different output characteristic to thermal power stations, which uh, depend on the, the flow of fuel. So as long as you can keep the gas flowing or the oil or the coal going into the power station, you'll get output. With wind, it relies obviously on the wind speed. And so typically you get periods of high wind and low wind. And so this has a, an implication on how you would run a power system. So let's now talk about the national power grid. We've spoken briefly about the generators, what we can do. There is transmission and distribution systems, and then there are us, the loads, what the power is used for. Um, and uh, these systems are actually the biggest and most complicated machines on the planet. Okay? In Australia, the electricity network on the east coast is connected from the tip of the, uh, uh, the coast of Australia, right up north, all the way down the, down the east coast of Australia, inland for many hundreds of kilometres down through the southern states and across to South Australia. So this is basically one machine. 5,000 kilometres of power lines, generators, switches, transformers, all connected together as a huge machine. They are the biggest and most complicated machines on the planet. And a schematic of what it looks like is, you know, these are the, the large remote coal-fired power stations in Australia in particular, but they could be nuclear in some parts of the world, but typically far away. Okay? And we put them on top of the coal because it's easier and more efficient to dig up the coal, burn it where it is, and move the electricity than it is to move the coal to where, where the power is needed. So the power stations are a long way away, and people don't like living, living next to them, basically. So the Electricity from the power station is stepped up to very high voltage. These are typically a quarter of a million volts, um, in some cases over a million volts on the very large power lines. It comes down then closer to like uh, a load centre, a, a big city, and the voltage then is stepped down and it comes down to us via the, you know, the poles and wires that we see in the street or sometimes underground. So voltages up here can be 100 and 50,000, 250,000 volts, down here maybe 132,000 volts, and down here typically 5,000 volts or so, and then to our home of 240. So the, the system is designed because the higher the voltage, the lower the losses. Okay? The losses are proportional to the current, and so if you want the same amount of power to flow, but with lower losses, you have to increase the voltage and the current goes down. So a key characteristic of electricity markets is not found in any other commodity market at all. And that is that the supply always must, must meet the demand. 
which means that the generators always have to provide just enough power to meet the requirement. And that requirement is the aggregation of everyone's use. So, for example, if, if I went over to the light switch and turned that off, that infinitesimally small amount of power that I'm not using has to be made up from somewhere else. And what, what would happen, theoretically, is that somewhere a generator would work just a little bit less because I don't need that. And if I put my kettle on and boiled it, a generator somewhere has to work just that little bit harder to meet that demand. Now, on a big system and with small loads like that, that is lost in the system. But when a big load comes on or goes off, the generators have to respond, and they have to respond very quickly. Okay, and we'll see that in a minute. But what happens if supply doesn't meet demand? If your geography is okay, this is, the, this is North America, okay? And it's a nighttime photo. That is Florida down there, and that's the, the bay. Uh, but you'll notice that there is a big, what looks like a bay up there. That's not actually a bay. That is the New York area that was thrown into blackout um, in August 2003. Okay? And that happened because somewhere here in the middle of the country, the power system became unstable and uh, there was a ripple effect that ended up blacking out that whole region. And that was something like, I think, 50 million people went without power for many, many hours. Um, and of course, when you turn off power to a major city like that, um, you have people dying. People get caught in lifts, hospitals go off, you know, everything that we depend on with electricity has failed. And that was because the supply couldn't meet the demand. So electricity is very different to anything like providing water or gas or food or anything because there's no inbuilt storage or resilience being able to buffer the changing output of the generator with the changing load. So we talk about power system reliability and security. Uh, and security is a measure of the ability of the system to tolerate a disturbance and to maintain the supply. If there is a disturbance in the system somewhere, like a, a generator fails for some reason, the system has to be robust enough to cover that loss of generation. Or if there is a major industry that is consuming energy and changing its consumption very quickly, the generators have to respond. And this is, I guess, comes down to the, uh, the issue of frequency control in power systems. Now remember, the whole system is connected. Okay? So the frequency, the alternating frequency in a power grid um, is linked from, in Australia, the top of you know, the east coast all the way down. So the entire system has the AC sine wave in synchronous with every user, every generator across the whole system. That's changing 50 times a second in Australia. Some places, I think the USA, 60 times a second. But in Australia, it's 50 hertz. So that system, that frequency, has to be maintained very, very closely. Um, and that frequency is a measure of the instantaneous balance of supply and demand. And the, the big the big machines, the power station turbines, have some buffer in them in that there's a large amount of rotating mass in those machines. You know, the turbine in a, in a big coal-fired power station might have a, a mass of 2,000 tonnes, and this thing is spinning at about 3,000 RPM. And if you have a few hundred of those machines all operating in synchronous, then there's a large amount of inertia there so that if some disturbance happens somewhere, there is sufficient rotating energy there to ride through a small disturbance. And that's one of the things that we're sort of um, going to have to manage as we move away from burning fuels in large thermal power stations. This system inertia is something we've taken for granted. So what happens when the load changes quickly and what happens when generation changes quickly is the frequency moves. And once the frequency moves away from the set point of 50 hertz, that's when trouble happens. Okay? Now, uh, we had a, an issue in Australia uh, late last year, in South Australia, one of the states, <coughs> Australia, where the system went black, 
basically that meant the whole state lost power supply, which was really the first time this had happened since, I don't know, the mid-1970s. Okay? Um, people weren't prepared for it. And so there was a huge uh, inquiry, what happened, what caused it. Okay? And basically the cause was there was a very severe weather event. It, the weather knocked over some of the transmission lines and the wind turbines that were feeding power into those transmission lines disconnected from the system as they were programmed to do. Because if the power line goes down, the wind turbine output, the electrical output, has to be stopped. Okay? Because it can't go anywhere, so the turbines disconnect and stop producing electricity. It's a little bit more complicated because they test, and if there is still a problem after a few seconds, uh, they will retest. If the problem goes away, then they can connect. But the system was basically, they were doing what they were designed to do. Anyway, it propagated across the whole state. The state had a blackout. Um, this is a, a, a chart from uh, the report that was looking at it. And it's a, um, the vertical axis is frequency in hertz. You may not be able to see those numbers, but that's 50 hertz, and that's 49.5. Generally, the frequency is kept usually within plus or minus about 1 or 2, 0.1 or 0.2 hertz of that, which is stable. And you can see it has been stable. Then what happened there was a, a little bit of a, a hiccup there. And the axis at the bottom, that point there is... 18 minutes past 4 o'clock, 14 seconds, 15 seconds, 16 seconds. So in two seconds, the frequency went out of control and dropped. So over a two-second period, the system lost stability and there was a cascading failure and the, the lights went out, basically, okay, in the state. So these things happen very, very quickly. It's not that, oh, well, we've got some time to do something. When the frequency moves out of the range, systems are designed to disconnect, to try and avoid damage and injury, etc. Lots of power flowing through these lines. And so things happen very, very quickly. Um, and so that, that was a problem in South Australia which was caused by not, um, not having a stable system. The supply couldn't meet the demand. Everyone was still using their electricity, cooking, industry, commerce, lights, university lecture halls, whatever, and when one small part of the system was unable to maintain that frequency, the rest of the system collapsed. Now, South Australia is connected to New South Wales. There is an interconnection so that power can flow both ways. And all the states um, in Australia have some degree of being able to move electricity from one state to another. And at the time, um, there was... Electricity was being imported from Victoria into South Australia, but the, you know, the, the power lines have a maximum capability. And over a second or two, that need for extra power from interstate went beyond the limits of that interconnector, and the interconnector then had to disconnect to save, to save the equipment. Okay. And that's when the, the whole state went black. And there, it, you know, there were parts of the state that didn't get electricity back for over a day or two. Now, that brings this issue of being able to dispatch electricity into a network, into sharp contrast. Because in the past, when we needed more power, we fed more coal or more gas. But when you're relying on things like solar and wind, you don't have that control. You can't say, well, I want more power out of my solar panel, because that depends on the, the weather conditions, the time of day, where you are, what the cloud cover might be. So we're, with renewable systems, we don't have that same level of what's called dispatchability. To say, OK, the load is going up because it's morning time, people are putting on their kettles, their toast, you know, having showers, hot water, the demand is going up quickly. With a large renewable-based system, you can't suddenly dial up more wind or more solar. So you're dependent on the weather conditions. Now, up to a certain point, the other systems, the thermal systems, can compensate. So if the demand is going up as more people are using power, uh, say, in the morning or the evenings, then the dispatchable systems, the ones that run on fuel, can be told to increase their output, and that manages it. But when you get to a point of maybe 30 40 or 50% of 
renewables, you're losing a lot of the capability of dispatching that. So if the wind dies down quickly or the sun goes away, whether it's on a cloud or late in the day, uh, you don't have that ability anymore to meet the load. So the supply is not meeting the load. And this is, uh, this is one of the major technical challenges of moving away from thermal systems to renewable systems, for example. Now, this is just a, a fantastic chart I like to look at. It's, um, it's the overlay of a month's worth of output from solar and wind farms, um, all overlain over the same time period. So it's the, the, the 24 hours of a day. And you can see this, um, the, um, that line there is the average of the requirement, the load, what, what this particular um, installation, whether it be a, um, a small town or a, a city, you can see in the mornings there is an increase in the demand on average as people want, you know, they get up, go to work, make coffee, breakfast, etc., use more electricity, drops down a little bit during the day and then in the afternoon and evening it goes up again. That's very typical of a power system. Overlain with the output from solar and output from wind. And you can see, you know, the solar during the middle of the day is what you'd expect, most of the output. Uh, the wind output is stochastic, so it's, it's um, not unpredictable, but relies on weather events. Okay, so you can forecast wind 12, 18 hours out, uh, but you can't control it, obviously. Um, and so you can see that in the middle of the day, there might be a lot of solar on most days, but there are days in there where there is very little. And here, there are times when there is very little wind. So the challenge is to try and manage this system to always meet that, uh, that demand. Can yes? Okay. So that we can have some questions if you want to. Okay, I've got about 10 quick slides to go through. Yeah, okay. Um, so I want to now just quickly uh, address how electricity is priced um, and how a market works because that will help explain why power station operators, governments, private industry don't just say, well, let's just go out and build you know, nuclear power stations or more renewables or more gas-fired power stations. Because in a market, it depends on the cost of doing these things and what people are willing to pay. So how much does it cost to make electricity? Well, that depends on the cost of the plant, the cost of the finance, the cost of the fuel, the life, operation, etc., etc. So you can calculate a, what's called a levelized cost of electricity. And this is roughly what it would cost um, to produce electricity, say, over a year per unit. And that typical unit is a kilowatt hour. So in Australia, our electricity prices, um, in Sydney, for example, would be something like 30 to 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay? Whereas going back you know, 10 years, they may have been 20 cents a kilowatt hour going back even more, you know, 15. So that's the sort of price that we pay. But that's not the levelised cost of making electricity. That's what we pay. And there is a difference. I won't, I won't go into that now, but the slides are available if you want. Um, so the Australian energy market yeah. is a, a system where the electricity and energy supply in Australia is run by some organisations. Um, and typically these are government controlled the Australian Energy Market Operator is a federal government um, operated system and it's there to make sure that the power system works reliably and affordably. But for many states like Victoria, South Australia and even New South Wales, the generators can be owned by private industry. And in fact the governments used to say that they didn't want to be in the business of owning and running power stations. So they opened it up to the private sector and investors then would look at that and say, okay, well, can I, can I make some money by investing a few billion dollars into a power station? And the, the issue for an investor is that they need to say, okay, well, this thing is going to sit there maybe for 30 years or 40 years. Uh, what's the cost of electricity going to be like 10 years out, 20 years out, 30 years out? How much am I going to pay interest on the money that I need to borrow to build this power station? What's it going to cost to operate? So that's the levelised cost of electricity. So they look at that and say, okay, well, if the levelised cost is 20 cents, 
we need to be able to sell it on average at least you know, 21 cents, otherwise you're going to lose money. So the market is there to try and facilitate those interactions between the generators and the people like us who pay for and use the electricity. Um, I've got, I have a link here which I was going to show you just briefly, if I think I could get out back onto the dashboard. Yep. This is the Australian Energy Market Operator uh, website and you can go in and have a look at what's happening to the electricity system in real time. Okay. So here we have, um, I guess, a diagrammatic um, representation of the states of Australia that are involved in the electricity market. So we have the Queensland state to the north of us, New South Wales where we are here, Victoria, Tasmania, which is connected to the rest, to the mainland by an undersea extension cord, basically, and South Australia. And so here we can see that the current wholesale price for electricity in Queensland is $59.88 a megawatt hour. So that's 5.9 cents a kilowatt hour. And remember, we, you know, we're paying roughly 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So the wholesale price, in other words, the price that the generators up there are being paid right now for their electricity. In Queensland is $59.88. There is connections between New South Wales and Queensland. That's these two things. And we can see at the moment power is flowing from Queensland to New South Wales where the price is $70. So the cost of electricity in the market in New South Wales is considerably higher than that in Queensland. And that would typically be because we're using more and there's not enough generation happening in New South Wales right now. These prices are based on a five minute average. Okay? So every five minutes that price can change. So New South Wales, $70. Victoria currently is paying, was paying $127, is now paying $126. So you can see the electricity price is changing, it's dynamic all the time. And there is power flowing, interestingly, from New South Wales into Victoria. So we have power coming from Queensland into New South Wales. New South Wales also generating its own electricity. But some of that is going down into Victoria because it's an even higher price there. So the generators in New South Wales are quite happy to sell electricity into Victoria because they're going to be paid more. Tasmania, 121, and South Australia, 126. Now, historically, these prices are huge. Two years ago, the average price didn't move much beyond about $35 to $40 a megawatt hour. Currently, you can see it's four times, five times that, which means eventually these prices are going to flow through to us. Now we don't pay according to wholesale price. You buy your electricity from a retailer. The retailer says here is the deal. It's going to be roughly 35 cents a kilowatt hour for you. But the retailer might be having to buy electricity at a much, much higher rate for some hours of the year. Now we don't get exposed to that, but eventually they have to try and recover that in the next round of bills. So the system is very dynamic, it's continuously operating, There's, it's an auction and every five minutes there are bids and if you're a power station owner you bid into this market and you say well I can provide this amount of electricity at this time for this cost and the operator stacks up all the bids and dispatches from the cheapest to the most expensive and the market is sort of designed to, to keep that price low. But if there's a failure somewhere in the system where a generator might trip because of some mechanical fault or something else, you will see that power will then start to flow from other states and the prices will jump up again. So this is, this is what the price and the demand of electricity looks like at a particular time. This was for uh, the 1st of March 2014. The, um, the green bars are, is the dollars in megawatt hours on the right hand side. And you can see it's at this stage was just a little bit on average below $50 a megawatt hour three years ago. Now it's sitting on average about $120 a megawatt hour, so it's more than doubled in price. And this is the blue curve is the demand, the amount, the quantity of electricity that the system has to deliver 
every second. Okay? We can't afford to move away from the ability to provide that energy when it's needed. So typically you see these cycles which are up and down for days. So the, the lowest demand for electricity is typically 4 a.m. in the morning. Then it starts to increase as people get up, turn on lights, turn on toasters, make coffee, have hot water systems that are electric based, etc. So in the morning there is a peak and typically in the afternoon and evening there is another peak. And then you can see these going up and down here. And that's a weekend. Okay? Not, you know, not nearly as much demand for electricity, typically on a weekend as during the working week. So electricity bills that we pay for usually have a, a number of components. There is the, the energy part, the actual kilowatt hours you pay per kilowatt hour, but it's only, it can be less than half of the bill. Okay? The actual amount of electricity that you buy can be less than half. Largely, it's the transmission and the distribution. In other words, moving the electricity from the power station to here. That's the expensive bit. That's what we're paying here. And then there's other bits on the top, like the, you know, the margin that the retailer has to make to buy electricity from a generator, pay the company that moves the electricity from where it's generated to where it's used, and to manage bills and you know, people ringing up and complaining about their power bill. So the top bit is the, the bit that we interact with. But the large part of the bill is the actual energy, the wholesale cost, and moving the electricity to us. Um, now this pool pricing mechanism, um, this is how the system actually determines what the cost or what they pay to the generator. So in this schematic, a very simplified diagram, there are for example, five generators here. We're saying generator one is, say, a, bl a black hole generator. Generator two may be a combined cycle gas plant where the efficiency is quite high but the cost of the gas is high. Generator three could be an open cycle gas turbine where the efficiency is not very good and the gas price is still high, etc., etc., up the, up the, uh, the chain. So at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., uh, every generator on the previous day sends their bids to the operator. So for today, all these generators yesterday would have sent the bids to the operator for today to say at 2 o'clock, generator 1, I'm prepared to sell 100 megawatts of electricity and I can sell it to you at $20. Generator 2 which is the more expensive gas one, says, look, I can also provide 100 megawatts, but I need $28 because the gas is more expensive and I'm not prepared to sell it less than that. Generator 3 says, look, I can probably sell you a little bit less than 100 megawatts, but I want $35 for my electricity because my efficiency is low and my gas price is high. So unless the price gets to 35, I'm not interested. And up it goes. So what happens is at 2 p.m. today, so remember all these bids are now in the record, at 2 p.m. today the demand is a little bit over 200 megawatts. Okay? So the operator says, okay generator 1 and generator 2, I want your 100 megawatts that you've promised me and it has to be delivered at 2 o'clock and continue to be delivered for the next half hour. Okay? So these two generators, right, they're generating electricity, the 100 megawatts each is going into the line. The demand is a little bit higher than what they have contracted to produce. So the operator is asking generator three to start dispatching, but not for the full 50 or so megawatts, just enough to meet the demand. So generator three is happy because they're getting paid their $35 and so on as the demand goes up and this could be a morning or an afternoon but then as the demand increases so we're 10 minutes past the start generator 4 is asked to generate okay you've made an offer $37 a megawatt hour we want you to start generating and eventually generator 4 is at its maximum capacity so is 3 so is 2 so is 1 the last bit of demand is met by generator 5 okay? a very very expensive generator may or may not be called but this generator is, going to, is saying, look, I'm not selling electricity for less than 38 because I'll make a loss. So the operator 
is continuously talking to the generators at the same time saying more or less based on their bid. Now the, the somewhat crazy thing is that all the generators get paid the top price. Okay? So the black coal generator who said, look, I want a minimum of $20 is actually paid up here up here, up here and up here. So the black coal generator is being paid $38 a megawatt hour for, the, for this period even though they bid in at 20. Okay. This is the way the system operates. And it's designed that way uh, for reasons that we, we, we won't go into. Um, but all the generators get paid the same amount because the electricity is the same whether it comes from a gas-fired power plant or a coal plant or some other plant. So all the generators are paid the same. Over the half hour, the prices are averaged. So the average for that half hour is $37 a megawatt hour. All the generators get that. As the demand drops, these generators turn off and eventually, you know, at night, there may only be a couple of coal-fired power stations running and they'll be getting their $20 a megawatt hour if that's what they bid. Now, the, the interesting and the spicy bit to this is that if you've got a, a wind farm, for example, um, you, can't, you can't offer a firm output at any particular time because you're not entirely sure how much wind is going to be blowing the day ahead. You've got a good idea, but not a perfect idea. So what the wind generators do, they bid to sell their electricity at zero dollars. Okay, so they send the bid to the operator. You can have all, our, all of our electricity any time tomorrow for nothing. Okay? So they bid in at zero dollars. They go to the top of the range of all the generators. So when the operator comes around to look at everyone's costs for electricity, the wind farms are always the cheapest. Zero. Okay? But in practice, because everyone gets the same, when it actually comes their time, they will get whatever the pool price is at that time. So the wind farms always bid in, or mostly bid in at zero dollars, but they get paid what everyone else does. And the, the spicy bit is that occasionally there is too much electricity at night. Okay? The demand is low, but there's a lot of wind power being generated and there's coal-fired power stations running as well. And so what happens is the price actually drops. And the price can drop to zero and it can drop below zero. Okay, um, you see, yeah. Here is a chart of New South Wales wholesale prices in May 2015. Uh, there is the zero baseline, so you can see most of the time it's above $20 a megawatt hour, but occasionally it's dropped below zero. So what does that mean? Okay, it means that the generators have to pay the operator to take their electricity. Okay. Now, it doesn't happen that often, but it has happened enough. And, of course, the coal-fired generators can't turn off easily. You know, they have a huge plant, 200 tonnes a minute of coal going into this thing. They can't just turn it off. So the coal-fired power plants basically pay to send their electricity into the market. And more and more of this is happening because at night there's more and more wind power and Often, there is more wind at night in many locations. So the, the market is forcing down the cost of electricity through the use of wind power. Okay? Now, the coal-fired power stations are not very happy about it, obviously. But this is one of the consequences of having a system where you can't dispatch electricity at the th flick of a switch. You're dependent on wind or sun, for example. Okay. Now, the last uh, one or two slides, I just wanted to go back and um, remember we were talking about the, uh, the efficiency of coal-fired power stations in general and how they operate. So if we have a look here um, in the schematic, we could say that for every 100 units of fuel energy that has gone into a, a coal-fired power station, for example, we know that about 65 of those units of energy, whatever they be, gigajoules, megawatt hours, doesn't matter, about 65 of those units is lost at the power station through the cooling towers and the exhaust stacks. Okay? They're only about 35% efficient. Then the, the electricity that's being sent down the lines, 
we're going to lose about another three of those units because of resistance in power lines and transformers, etc. So at the end here, we might have 32 units of energy from, you know, from the 10,000 tonnes of coal that was burnt that day in that power station. 32% of that energy in the coal has got to us to do something. And in New South Wales, a megawatt of electricity produces about a tonne of CO2. And just think for a minute what we're actually doing if we're going to use that electricity to boil water, okay? which is a very typical thing that we would do. We'd put a cup of tea on, put the kettle on. We are throwing away two-thirds of the chemical energy in the fuel as heat, right? which is what we want when we boil water. So we've thrown that away. We've converted that mechanical and thermal energy into electricity that we've sent down a few hundred kilometres of power lines and we've plugged a, a kettle or a toaster in there to create heat again. Okay? So you can see there is some degree of madness here. We are throwing away the bulk of the thermal energy at the power station because we can't access it. Okay? You can't go to a power station and capture some heat to boil water. So we're throwing away two-thirds and we're converting a lot of it back to heat back here because it's convenient. So you can see there is a, an element of insanity there. We are wasting a valuable fuel when we are converting electricity to heat, for example. Okay? Because we're throwing away all the heat of the power station because we can't use it. If we had a power station very close by, we might be able to use that heat. We can't use it here. Okay, so just remember what you need. Do you need the energy? Do you need the megawatts? Or, hours, or do you need light or hot water or motion or something else? You can get uh, 30 lumens of light for a thousand hours out of an incandescent bulb, a heat bulb, and that will consume 50 kilograms of coal, 130 litres of water, and produce 100 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Or you can produce the same amount of light with a high efficiency common fluorescent light bulb that only consumes 10 kilograms of coal, 26 litres of water, produces 20 kilograms of CO2. So it's, think about the service that you need, not the actual energy. No one really wants to buy energy. We want to buy lighting, we want to buy refrigeration, we want to buy motion. We don't really want to buy uh, energy per se. So this afternoon, if I come back, I'm going to talk about this challenge now of moving the existing power system, which has been designed and built and investments of trillions of dollars into a system that we're going to have to move away from very quickly. And that system is going to be a very, very different system and the technical, scientific and engineering challenges, the economic challenges are huge. I think the biggest technical and engineering challenges that the world has ever seen. So we'll talk about that this afternoon, but please, if you have some questions or comments, um, We've got a bit of time there. Don't actually have any. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry.